So the USB port on my Gogoplex broke and I needed a quick replacement. And when I did a post on that, a lot of you guys were saying I should get the Ferris sweep. And that was a really good idea. I was really um, kind of a bit daunted by the idea of actually having to solder a keyboard. But because the Ferris sweep uses microcontrollers instead of all individual components like the Gogoplex, um, it's actually pretty simple to put together. So it's basically a case of, of soldering the microcontroller and the switches and the TRS cable and you're done. Um, and it really was that straightforward. So in this video, I'm going to take a look at that process uh, just to show you how kind of approachable it actually is. It's so a big shout out to Kayak's video, uh, which helped me get started with this as well. So do take a look at that one. So obviously this is a really small keyboard. It's 34 keys instead of the 36 on the Gogoplex. So I've done another video on the 34 key layout. So do take a look at that to see how easy it is actually to live with a board like this day to day. So the striking thing about the Ferris, of course, is the extreme stagger on the little finger column. And this is really interesting. So regular viewers of this channel know a video I did a while back uh, where I looked at the angle of my fingers across the columns of the keyboard. And with the Moonlander and the plank, I found my sort of preferred angle over the column was actually quite similar. And I could actually achieve a fairly neutral wrist position even on the plank as a result of that. And when I used the Moonlander, I actually adjusted the halves to be fairly similar. It was still slightly, I was still slightly reducing that wrist angle on the split. Uh, but the reason for that, I think, actually comes down to the position of the little fingers. So basically, the higher up that little finger column is, the more I need to rotate my hand uh, so that my little finger can reach them. And that sort of forces this angle across the columns. Um, and I don't know, yeah, this obviously varies according to everyone's finger length. But for me, that's how I have to do it to avoid moving my hand excessively if I want to reach those little finger keys. So for me, I prefer to have my hand rotated across the board so that I can reach the little finger keys without moving my hand from the home orientation, the home position. Uh, but with the little fingers brought down, I can then rotate my hand so that my fingers are then back in line with the columns. And I can kind of see the appeal of that overall because it means your hand can go more parallel with the board. And I think there's sort of less overall finger movement to reach the keys if you are moving directly in line with the columns. But it's for me, the only way that was possible was to bring those pinky columns down to the kind of stagger that we've got with the Ferris. So overall, really pleased with the Ferris layout here. I love the fact that it's only got two thumb keys, actually. I was a bit nervous about that, but having created a layout that works, it's actually great just having the simpler arrangement for your thumbs. It's less effort to get your head around it. And, you know, I did find myself quite often hitting the wrong thumb key before when I had three to choose from. You know, am I going left or right from the home position? Now there's just your home position and the other key. Uh, so it's kind of simpler to, to get your head around the complex layout that you need when you're using a board this small, uh, when you actually force yourself to work with fewer thumb keys, I think. So the nice thing about the Gergoplex was that all the components were soldered directly to the board. So it was super flat, super minimal in its appearance, uh, but actually looks like a real headache to solder together. So the original Ferris is actually built like that as well with all the little tiny components built directly onto the board. So if you fancy a bit more of a challenge, you can go down that route. So the Ferris Sweep is, a, is this alternative version of the Ferris that doesn't use that direct onto the board approach with all the, all the components and instead uses a single microcontroller. And that makes the whole process of putting this together a lot easier. So I just want to thank the original creators of these projects for making these open source and available. It's just amazing to be able to see the files and send them off to a, to a PCB uh, manufacturer and get them delivered to you. Uh, you know, you don't have to wait for sort of uh, uh, ind independent vendors to make these and ship them out. You can actually just jump in and do it yourself as a result of these being open source. So I'm just going to quickly run through the kind of steps I took to make the changes to the PCB before I sent it off to uh, have it manufactured. So essentially, this is the sweep version of the Ferris by David Barr. And we could just go ahead and download the Gerber file that's already in this repository. So we could find this file, download it, and then literally just upload it to one of these PCB printers. And you'd have a version of the Ferris PCB uh, sent to you. But I wanted to make a few changes. I wasn't very happy with the curve across the top, and I wanted to put my own artwork on it. So I sort of jumped in and worked out how to actually go about doing that. So if we first thing we want to do is download the zip file and we can see in here we've got the folders for each of the versions. So the one I used was the compact version here and we can see these are the KiCad files now. Uh, there's the original Gerber which we could just use straight away but instead I'm going to open the PRO file here which will open this up in KiCad. And from here we can double click this one which will open the PCB in the editor here. So this is a pretty intimidating kind of app to use if you haven't used it before. Uh, it took me a little bit to figure it out, but basically you've got layers and these are the layers that make up the PCB. So we can see there's an F and a B version of each of these layers. And that means it's either the front version or the back version. So on the PCB, you can obviously have traces and things on one side that are different to traces on the other side. Uh, so this is how that's set up basically. So if we switch to this one, we can see that's the back one. So the green one is the back one, the red one is the front one, and this is the copper layer. 
So you can see if we zoom in here, we can see the individual traces that go from the uh, through holes. So I find it quite useful to enable this mode here, which gives you a sort of focused version, only shows you the layer you're looking at basically. Uh, so it's easier to sort of see what you're dealing with. So the first thing I wanted to do was actually change this cutout shape because I didn't really want the curve across the top. So if we go back to all the layers, we can see the edge of the keys is actually shown uh, by these boxes. So basically I wanted to make this line, the cutout line here, match this top staggered edge of the keys. So we've got the edge cuts layer selected with this little triangle here and we can zoom in. So if I put the focus mode back on, we can see our yellow line here. And that's what we want to edit. So if we zoom right in, now you can actually just select parts of this line. It's not all joined up. They're just individual bits. So if we just go ahead and hit backspace, we've just taken that out. So we can go ahead and do that all the way around. Now if I just go back to the normal mode, we can see, yeah, we do want to get rid of this little curve as well. All right, so if we zoom in, we can see our edge cut line here um, ready for us to add a curve. And you can see it's actually inset slightly from the keycap outline anyway. So I'm just going to sort of bring in a curve up here and then I'll carry on a little bit inset as well with my horizontal. So we're going to choose this radius tool here. Uh, the way this works is pretty weird. You, the first thing you actually do is you're clicking the sort of central axis of your radius. And the second time you click, you make the, the start point of the line and then you draw it and it always goes anti-clockwise. So you can see I've missed it there, so that's okay. What we're gonna do is just move it and you can see that little crosshair which means it's now in the right place for it to join up. I'm just gonna make it the same thickness as the original as well. So it looks the same. And then from there we can go ahead and use the straight line tool. If we look for that little crosshair, we know we're starting in the same place and we're going to go to here, we're going to leave room for a radius again like that and right click and click cancel if you're in that situation where you want to finish off the line and switch to a different tool so again what we're going to do here is click and we can see if we line this up actually hopefully that will be roughly in the right place first click, second click is the starting point and then we go to where we want it to finish. And we can go back to the straight line to go up. So that's basically it. Obviously this radius is not really big enough, uh, but you could fiddle with that until you're happy with that shape. So if you wanted to change the artwork, you can see they've got some artwork here. Um, if you select that, you can see it's a footprint on the silks layer. So if we hit backspace, that will delete that. And now we can see basically that we've still left with this shape, uh, which is actually in this uh, copper layer and it's part of the fill. So the fill didn't go over where that footprint was. Um, so we can refill these now basically. So if we unfill all the zones and then fill all the zones, now we can see it's actually filled that in with the copper fill layer here and it's actually got our shape uh, right as well now. So that's no longer showing outside of our cutout shape. And if we actually just take a little look at this now by jumping into the 3D viewer, so we can actually see it taking shape now and it starts to look a bit more like um, you know, what I had in mind with this. So if we want to add our own artwork from a JPEG image, what we need to do is jump back to KiCad, click this one here, which will open this bitmap to component converter. So we can load a file, and this is just fine to load this as a JPEG here. I've got a, just a, a thumbnail from one of my other videos. Um, if we go down here, we can see that. Uh, you can see the resolution here, and that's what changes the basically the size that this is going to come in at. So if I change that back to 300, and what we can do is change it to a mod file here, and we can say which one it's going to go on as well. So we're going to go for the front silk screen, and then we do export. 
So we want to add the footprint now. So we can do place footprint, click here, and this will load the footprint libraries, which should hopefully by default include the location that we uh, exported to. And we found it there. We can see that's, <laughs> that's how it, it turned out. So we could just kind of place it like that. Now, actually, the fact that it overflows outside the PCB here, I just left mine like that, and it didn't seem to make any difference. Uh, obviously, you know, they just sent me the board with it cut out, so uh, it was actually not a problem. So you could just easily do that if you wanted to. So the 3D viewer does actually show all of the artwork outside the PCB, but you can get an idea of what it's going to look like, um, and it wasn't an issue when I sent this. Uh, so from here, if we want to make the Gerber file, we just go into Plot, um, I think you need to do this. I'm not quite sure. This is I'm just sort of learning as I was going here. Generate the drill files first and then click plot. And then basically, back in our folder, we will have a new folder called Gerber. So it's just a question of compressing that to a zip file. And then we can just go back to your PCB printer of choice and upload that file. So if we add Gerber file here, so here we go, we can see that uh, all looks okay. We can see that we've got both sides showing. I obviously only put the silk screen on one side. Uh, so if we go down, we can see some of the other options and you can change that. It gives you a rough idea of what it's gonna look like. With this design, this is a reversible PCB, which means you get the same half printed five times, but you can use the same one on its back for the other half of the keyboard. Uh, the only thing to remember there is when you put the controllers on, and this is why it says here, look, controller face up and controller face down. So that's just to remind you which way round the controller needs to be placed when you're putting it into the sockets, uh, because obviously the connections need to be the right way round. So you can actually also use this online Gerber viewer, which is a bit better a, a bit better at rendering the output compared to the built-in tools. Now this is a nicer view because it shows us with it actually, uh, the silk screen automatically just cut off at the edges. Um, so that's pretty cool. And you can go into layers and toggle it all off and just see how it's all gonna look. So that's a nice way of, uh, of seeing what it's gonna look like there. So you can change these um, settings if you want. Basically, mainly you just wanna talk about the uh, the colors. You can change different uh, PCB colors. The black is a kind of nice matte black here, actually. Um, but with uh, this one, it was a bit more glossy. I don't know what that difference is, is all about. And you can specify thickness. I've actually, I did 1.6 to start with, but I've actually done a 1.2 now, and I think that's actually okay. It's a little bit more flexible, but it's a bit thinner and a bit lighter. So uh, I'm not quite sure if there's any other implication to that, uh, but you could do 1.6 to play it safe. Um, and then you can do this remove order number if you don't want anything printed on your board. It's pretty mind-blowing how cheap this is actually to do this. Uh, but that's basically the process of, of tweaking um, one of these great open source projects to the way you want it and then getting it sent off and, and uh, ordered as a PCB. So once it's arrived, you just solder it all together. So I socketed these controllers onto this board because I knew that I wanted to experiment with the nice nanos uh, later and make this a wireless version. These are the Elite Cs, so it's no wireless capability here, just USB. Um, but because we're using the sockets, we can actually switch these controllers out onto the keyboard at a later date, and that's a good way of doing this. So to do that, you kind of solder the sockets onto the board, and then you solder the pins into the microcontroller while it's in place with a bit of masking tape uh, in between to stop uh, solder dribbling down into the sockets and sealing the whole thing together. I didn't do that on the first half, I just about got away with it, I think. So soldering was quite out of my comfort zone, so I did a bit of research before attempting this. And I think the tips that, that stood out to me that made this a lot easier um, are to use a really hot soldering iron with a fine tip, uh, very fine solder, and use flux from a flux pen, and, and you need to liberally apply that before you do the soldering. And with all that, you know, it worked okay for my first attempt. It's definitely not very neat, uh, but it all works and nothing's fallen apart since then. Uh, I was kind of couldn't quite believe that it actually just worked first time. So this is a really fantastic way of getting one of these small, tiny, chalk-based keyboards uh, without having to wait for the kind of bespoke vendors to, to build one for you. Um, you just use the PCB manufacturers and the open source projects out there, and order all the parts and then just put it together. It takes a couple of hours, you know, but it's, it's great fun and brilliant to better have one of these in your hands. So if you click my name below, you can browse the channel and see some of the other videos I've done. I've done loads of videos on keyboards and other layouts and all the kind of ins and outs of this journey that's taken me up to this point. Hopefully you'll agree it's worth subscribing and I hope you enjoy the rest of your day.